Stay hungry, stay foolish. I want to thank our sponsor, Zai Boli, transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services, enabling businesses to move funds with ease and manage multiple payment workflows. Check out Zai at hellozai.com. Let's get into the latest episode of Brains, Beliefs and Biases here on The Innovation Show with the author of Why We Do What We Do, Dr. Helena Bosky. The brain is the basis of everything we do, how we communicate, how we behave, feel, remember, pay attention, create, influence and decide. Today's episode combines scientific research with concrete examples and illustrative stories to clarify the complex mechanisms of the human brain. It offers valuable insights into how our brain works every day at home and at work and provides practical ideas and tips to help us lead happy, healthy and productive lives. The thoughts you have and the words that you speak all have an effect on your neural architecture and today's book explains what that means in a way you can understand. It is a great pleasure to welcome the author of that book, Why We Do What We Do, Understanding Our Brain to Get the Best Out of Ourselves and Others. Dr. Helena Bosky, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aidan. It's great to be here. It's great to have you on the show. And I absolutely love the book. And I'm so happy to say to our audience, I have a copy up for grabs. Just sign up to the innovationshow.io newsletter and you'll be in the hat to win a copy of this brilliant book. If you want to understand the brain, Helena does a magnificent job of breaking it down for us, the layperson. So maybe we'll start with neurons, synapses, lobes and hemispheres to kind of give an overview of the structure of the brain as a way to start the show today. So we have this uh, remarkable setup where you have lobes. So you have around four lobes um, split across two hemispheres. And these lobes, are the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, parietal and occipital. So frontal is here. Uh, parietal here, occipital and temporal here. And these are split across two hemispheres. And they, they they are designed to work as an integrated whole, but also do kind of different things. And they develop at different times of our development, of our when we're growing up. Um, the frontal lobe um, is talked about a lot now because we are exploring more about the teenage brain. And this is the last part of the brain that fully forms when we're growing up. Um, as Robert Sapolsky says, uh, it's a 25 year construction project and it doesn't fully form until we're in our mid twenties. So this might explain why, and this is this houses our executive functioning, our decision-making, a lot of our rational thought and judgment, uh, but it might also explain uh, if we said teenagers have an underdeveloped frontal lobe, it does explain quite a lot. Um, about the behavior that we see around us. Um, the temporal lobe, a lot is going on in there. Um, it houses our endocrine system, hormonal release. Um, one of our memory structures, a very important one called the hippocampus. Um, this sits next to the amygdala, which lights up whenever there's anything uh, uncertain, potentially threatening, unusual, keeps us alive. Um, and the hypothalamus, which is our master gland working with our pituitary gland. Um, the parietal lobe is, uh, takes in sensory information. It also is uh, one of the areas of the brain linked to movement, visual uh, perception, spatial awareness, um, not visual perception, but spatial awareness. And Einstein's parietal lobe was a little bit bigger than the normal human parietal lobe. And our seeing brain, the visual cortex, at the back of the head, this is the part of the brain we see with. And information is always being communicated between all of these areas to help us deal with the environment. Um, and the brain is set up to keep us alive. But more importantly, the brain is designed to avoid death. So it is it is very sensitive to anything potentially threatening. So it had to learn very quickly, is that a snake? Is that a stick? Is that a snake? Is that a stick? And so it had to make uh, a very rapid prediction to keep us alive. So it would rather err on the side of caution and overreact to something than uh, than say you're okay. So we do have a brain that's uh, that's designed to react to the world around us um, very quickly. And of course, the world of COVID, where we've been bombarded with information, um, we have become more sensitive to uh, more threatening 
um, information and stimuli around us. So the brain is now very sensitive to anything potentially uncertain or threatening. And so we are more reactive to, to uh, the world around us. Then deep inside the brain, we have neurons. We have around 86 billion neurons. They're all socially distanced. None of them touch. But an electricity comes charging down. The axon terminal, it can't jump over a gap. So it's turned into these incredible chemical messengers called neurotransmitters that take the message on. And these really are our chemicals of emotion. They affect our mood and well-being. We've heard of a lot of them. Serotonin, which makes us happy. Oxytocin, which makes us bond and love. GABA, which makes us relax. Dopamine, which keeps us motivated. It's released in anticipation of uh, of a reward. Um, acetylcholine and noradrenaline, which keep us moving and switched on. Uh, there are many of the melatonin, which helps us sleep. So uh, these have all got to be kept in careful balance. And when the world is out of balance, our poor brain gets out of balance as well. So we have to really look after it and try and get it to reset itself in a world that feels a little bit uncertain at the moment. We're going to do part two of today's episode as well. And in that part two, we're going to explain change management, how biases affect us, etc. So this is part of the brain's beliefs biases series. So it's absolutely perfect. Also change management, most of our audience, Helena, work in change management and innovation. And as if that wasn't hard enough, post COVID world is even more difficult now. Maybe you'll say a word on that for those people who don't get to join us for part two, because we have been affected. The amygdala has certainly been affected for people. And as a result, we're even more sensitive to change than ever before. Yes, you know, and even pre COVID, you know, telling the brain to embrace change is, is, is almost an impossible ask, because the brain's job is to, uh, to keep us, you know, to keep us alive. And so it has to be able to, um, it's set up to be able to have to predict quickly how we need to deal with the world. So because of that change, which is very unpredictable, uncertainty, which is very unpredictable, these are things that aren't naturally embraced by an instrument that has to make these rapid predictions and needs loves to feel in control. Uh, Post-COVID, we've switched on these survival mechanisms over and over again. So the, the, the same systems that keep us alive in normal times, you know, in 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 more relaxed times, um, we're already being switched on too much. We all we all were already living in a world where we're being bombarded by information. Social media um, had had exerted quite a pernicious effect on on um, particularly on the younger generations, where we crave attention from strangers and we need to feel that endorsement from you know the world around us. And we were eating all the wrong foods. So coming into COVID weren't in great shape. And then we we were switching on during COVID because of mass uncertainty and constantly and, and fear was starting to take hold. Um, the poor amygdala, which whose job it is to go wah, 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 whenever anything is, is not, uh, doesn't feel right. This was being switched on over and over again, setting off this dramatic chain reaction through our entire system as if we were meeting a real life threat to our lives, you know, real uh, stressor in our environment. This system was only designed to be switched on and switched off very quickly. And it's being switched on over and over again. Now, the more times it gets switched on, the more the brain gets used to being switched on all the time. So it's getting switched on for the tiniest thing, even um, even anticipated threats, things that may not ever happen. Uh, it's being switched on for and even imaginary threats, things that aren't even real. The brain doesn't care. The brain can't tell the difference. It will switch the system on um, at the same time. So we're living in this very hyper reactive, hypersensitive world where we have felt fear. And of course, when we feel fear for a long time, anger follows quickly afterwards. And anger and fear come from the same part of the brain and anger strengthens us to act, mobilizes our muscles, keep lets us feel in control. And of course, now we're living in a world where we're uh, suffering from the residue of these emotions and still fearful, still angry. Uh, and so we're having to try and get back um, our brains back to uh, a more peaceful state where we can take in information, we can think about things, we can reflect, take a step back um, from the world around us. 
but we're on all the time. And this is not what we're designed to be. I thought about how you were saying about the brain and we'll all have encountered somebody and I'm sure you have in, in your travels as well throughout different organizations throughout your studies a doctor no type character who just goes no we're not doing that no we're not doing that and I thought about the brain in that in the world of unbelievable turbulence is that doctor no just going to go no nah, ain't doing that that's a threat to us that's a threat to us because a few weeks ago we had on Stephen Kotler and he was telling us that when your your brain actually always operates below its possible threshold. So when you get into the flow state, for example, you're able to get a little bit more out of yourselves than you would. So for example, an athlete in a competition might perform better or do a personal best versus when they're training. And it's because the brain is keeping them below the threshold because you can lift, say, for example, on the bench press, you think you can lift 150 but actually you can lift 200, but your brain won't let you in case you get injured, etc. And I thought about that as a great metaphor for what we're experiencing, because we're always below that threshold of, of performance. But I say that to say, and I'd love your thoughts on this, about the neurodiversity of people, because one of the things this show has taught me, and my experiences in change management is that when I'm speaking to somebody, I'm speaking to a brain, and that brain is very different to the person standing beside them and that other person over in the room. And when they're having arguments, or they're disagreeing about the, the strategy of an organization or the future of an organization, it's often driven by the variation in the way they perceive the world. When we talk to someone, we assume that our message is being received in the way that it's coming out of us. And people filter, they filter information through their uh, well, you know, the, bra the brain receives information through the senses. So this is called sense data. And sense data, this is all the brain has to go on is sense data. And the brain receives the sense data and then plays around with it inside the brain. And it plays around with it based on, one, what it thinks it knows, two, what it's expecting to hear or see, and, and three, what it wants to hear or see. So you have this incredible um, editing going on in the brain. So we don't ever hear the absolute truth. We don't hear the, uh, the, the, the exactly the same message as, as the message that's being communicated. We hear our own version of it, and we will then believe that. So we always have to have our checks and balances in place. And our biases are part of our psychological immune system. They're there to help us take these very quick shortcuts through the data that we're receiving all the time. And uh, we this is why we'll never fix our biases. They're there forever. They're part of how we stay alive. But what we have to do is recognize that we will only have a limited view. And so somebody else's view that might differ with ours might pick up the bits that we've actually missed. And so we complete the picture far more when we are in a diverse environment. The big problem is the brain doesn't like anything that's different because similarity is easy to predict. You know, we we like people who are like us. Um, I used to go at the beginning of lockdown, I was running around a park in London in the morning and uh, I used to run and, and watch people walking their dogs and I was amazed at how often the dog looked just like their owner. <laughs> and I thought, this is a really weird phenomenon because I know we like people who are like us, um, but we also pick pets that, are look, look, that look like us as well. And this is, a, you know, this is a really, this is to keep us safe. We just literally want to feel safe. And so similarity feels safe. Diversity does not feel safe. And this is why we don't have a diverse enough diet because the gut and the brain both need a diverse diet, a cognitive diet, a nutritious diet. We have to stick differences into our gut and our brain, but we don't do it because it doesn't feel safe. You mentioned diversity there, and there's a contentious issue. I, I don't know if you remember the book, Men Are From Venus, Women Are From Mars. Yeah. Do you remember? Women Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, yeah. yeah. I remember that was being talked about years ago, and I read it, and I didn't really understand it at the time. But years later now, as we understand the brain more and more, you can see, well, just as we've evolved to like people like us, because that wasn't a threat, or just because we've evolved for the amygdala to be constantly erring on the side of caution or negativity. 
our brains have evolved differently because of our origins of the male of the species and the female of the species. And right at the start of the book, you pose a huge question. And that is, do women and men have different brains? And I'll tee you up here with a quote, I'd love you to take us through this. There is considerable debate among researchers as to whether men and women have different brains. Scientists are divided over whether any differences in the brain are the result of our genetic makeup, nature, or whether instead, they are the consequence of the family and culture we were raised in, which is nurture. In fact, a recent study has even suggested that there are no real brain differences between the sexes, and that any brain differences emerge because of the significance we give them. All the same, there are structural and neurochemical differences including a possible explanation for chocolate cravings, you tell us, I'd love you to take us through this. So yeah, this is a I mean, this is this is one of the biggest debates. And um, now the world we're living in, which is, you know, it's so hypersensitive to anything when we talk about male versus female, because now I think somebody said there are about 66 different genders. So the gender is a social construct that we identify with, but the sex, the biological differences, um, still have uh, caused considerable debate and people just don't agree on it. There's no uh, there's no one answer to this. Um, there are there are schools of thought which suggest that the we give children the, uh, the the role of male or the role of female by putting them in blue or putting them in pink from an early age. Um, the environment we get dropped into our DNA, gets dropped into our environment and not every gene gets a chance to express itself. Um, and so the environment then plays an enormous role in ensuring which genes then emerge and, and how they play out. Um, there is, you know, there's a lot of debate around that. Um, but there are, you know, it, it is a, it is a fascinating debate and people, but people feel very strongly about it. So I I weigh in somewhere between the two. I think there are we have to look at the, the studies that have suggested that there are anatomical differences. Um, the memory region, the hippocampus, has been found to be larger on the left-hand side of the female brain than the male brain, which might explain why women can remember personal information more, birthdays, anniversaries, that every tiny, tiny detail of a conversation she had with you last year she remembers what she was wearing where she was standing what she said what you said you know and and uh, sometimes men think well how the hell does she remember that well <laughs> i mean we do have that capacity um the uh, the role of testosterone we can't deny that um uh, that men tend to produce more testosterone than women um and serotonin is an interesting is an interesting one because serotonin tends to be um, more prolific in the male brain. So I think it, it's produced a lot more in the male brain, or it's certainly more available in the male brain, which might explain why there are more incidences of female depression. Now, there is a food substance called tryptophan, which is an amino acid, which helps to boost serotonin production in the brain. And tryptophan is found in dark chocolate, which is great news, because it means that we can reach for dark chocolate and know that it has a good uh, brain effect. So this might explain why um, women do might want to reach more for the chocolate than the men. But equally, we have to be very careful about making these very grand statements and also recognize that a lot of the studies um, have, uh, you know, there are for every psychological study that comes out or neuroscientific study that comes out, there is another one closely on its heels that refutes and disclaims the, the findings. So we have to see all of the studies together and take what we can from each one and learn from each one because they all have something of value to say. I find that really, really difficult. That That's one of the most difficult things. I'm fascinated by the field and I find it so difficult, like even diet. So like you said, the the diverse gut. So I work on that. I eat the sauerkraut and, you know, the kefir and all these type of things. And, and, and actually to keep metabolic diversity or metabolic flexibility so i you know and even you know i'll go from one day from one meal a day to two meals a day to a feast day which would be just a normal eating day but the whole idea is 
well, if I want my brain to be flexible and agile, I need my body to because they're feeding each other all the time, they're communicating with each other all the time. And that will keep me more flexible and agile in my mindset. And I say that to say, one of the most difficult things is the refuting evidence every time, oh, well, what's good for you is bad for you. And, you, and it's very hard to find the truth. And I go back to what you said earlier, in the pandemic, it was the same thing, because there's such an onslaught of information for people, they don't know which way to turn. And then, as you say, in the book as well, in a media landscape that is proliferated by things like polarization, and then fake news, it leaves people very, very stressed. So if we think of the brain as a prediction machine, a guessing machine, uh, when I show it on my talks, I show it sort of in a crystal, you know, it was like a crystal ball, um, because it's, it's, it's constantly having to second guess um, how to deal with this, how to deal with this. And it doesn't wait for all the information to line up. So we'll make these very quick decisions and we'll fill in the gaps, we'll complete the picture uh, without having all the evidence. It doesn't matter if we don't feel that we've given all the evidence to people. The brain will, will find it anyway, we'll, and it will find it from various sources, which, it, which is why, because it has to find, it has to seek certainty, it hates uncertainty. So it seeks certainty and clarity from anywhere it can. So it pulls information from around it, from fake news, um, from um, information that that we, you know. And remember what I said. You know, we we look for information that we expect to see, that we like to see, that conforms with our existing belief system. So we pull information from the world that, that helps justify our own behaviour or justifies our own belief, and we complete the picture that way. And this is why um, in a situation like the pandemic, it's been really important for organizations to provide as much information as possible, not wait for it to be lined up and perfect. Because in that time, people are making their own minds up anyway. We have to get clarity to people in, and certainty to people and information to people as quickly as possible. You know, I always say not many things are urgent, but clarity really is right now. And I've heard organizations say, work anywhere from anywhere uh, from anywhere at any time and i no 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 that's too abstract brain needs to know um how what when who why give the brain a reason give the brain clarity give the brain certainty and don't wait for things to be perfect just give as much information as you can because this is what we need that is such a valuable insight for our audience as well for ceos for example who are leading change programs oftentimes they go away and they work with the the consultants to try and create the perfect plan and bring it to people and there's a big kind of gap of communication in the meantime and then they communicate it or they think they do in a one-off big town hall meeting etc people don't really understand it and you know when i work with organizations and ceos i go you have to communicate what you think is ad nauseum, you think you're overdoing it. And when you think you're overdoing it, you're probably just doing about just right, or maybe still underdoing it. Because that for the message to land, people need to hear it over and over and over. That's one thing. And I'd love you to talk about this one, perhaps is oftentimes, many of our audience who work in change roles, for example, heads of innovation or transformation, they have a really loose job description. And at the start, that feels great. You're like, great, that means I can shape it myself, I'll shape my role, etc. And sometimes it works out very, very few times it works out. Because we do need the restriction, we need the boundaries. And I always think Helena, of children, and the terrible twos, you know, that whole uh, hypothesis that if they don't get kind of oh, you can't do that, don't touch the hot cooker, or they don't seem that that feel that discipline from their parents, they actually feel worse. And they actually feel kind of scared in the world. This is even more important in the teenage years when teenagers are trying to figure out uh, their own, um, you know, who they are, and their brains are going through the most incredible amount of changes. So during our early years, we're building connections and synapses. So when two neurons come together, through the transference of chemical messengers, the neurotransmitters, we create a synapse. And every time we do something new, we grow a new connection. Now, during our early years, these connections are being 
being built exponentially. We're having this incredible surge in brain growth. And by the time we get to the teenage years, um, the, the brain has to be able to clean up. And this is called synaptic pruning. And so the brain, the, the brains of teenagers are being pruned back as teenagers uh, push boundaries. Uh, they take risks because their their dopamine levels are high. Um, they are um, wanting to. Uh, they they need that that endorsement and that encouragement from parents, but they also need those boundaries to know to what extent can I go to this um, this stage? Um, you know, am I safe enough? to explore. And they did a really interesting study, I think, with young kids. Um, and they put young kids playing outside a house. And I don't know if you know this, Aidan, but I don't know where it came from, but they put young kids playing outside a house and there was no fence around the garden. So there was no barrier around the garden. So kids, were put, they would just sent them outside, go, said, kids, go play in the garden. The kids played near the house because they didn't know how far to go. But the minute they then put the kids back in in the in the garden but put a fence up around the edges of the garden quite a long way away but they saw kids saw this fence they were able to run up to the fence so their their desire to explore and their desire to to see and to be curious were ignited um because they uh, they could see the boundary they knew that it was safe because the boundary existed but it helped them go a little bit further than they would have done had they not had that boundary. So I think we've got to take that lesson in and, and understand that boundaries are really good. And, you know, creating those, you know, giving people too much freedom is not healthy because we don't know how far we can go. And we need to know that, you know, that there's a safety and safety is one of the biggest needs for the human brain. We talk a lot about psychological safety. It's one of the big buzzwords now. Um, that's out there. And psychological safety is about feeling safe enough to speak out, even if what you're saying might be unpopular to or, or not agreed with or, you know, in in discordance with the rest of the group. We have to create that environment where this uh, we're, we're able to feel safe enough to say something that's brave. Um, and we can only do that when we have these um, these boundaries, these parameters in place. I love that. And it's a great metaphor for I work a lot in that idea of psychological safety. And exactly that, like, you can't have that without first having like, well, what's the rules of engagement here? How far can we go? What are the parameters? What are the values we want to be known as? And they're essentially the fence, you know, putting the fence around the organization or the team to know where how far can I stray the same for a job role? It's exactly the same thing. You know, I thought about how animals do that as well. I mean, dogs urinate around an area, cats will actually stick to around a house to an area that they know very well. We it's the brain, it's the way the brain operates. It's it's so valuable to know that But we are animals. I mean, I think we need to see ourselves as animals with very big brains, brains that have, you know, have been remarkable because they have adapted you know, we do have a remarkable ability to adapt to our environment and to push to push boundaries. We need to know the boundaries we can push, um, and we have this incredible ability to, um, you know, to reorganize um, ourselves, but reorganize and redesign the world we're in. But we also have to recognize that we do have a brain that hasn't evolved as quickly as the world we've now given ourselves. So we're now stuck with a fairly old system in a very new world. And um, this is why we're starting to see, um, you know, the impacts of that on our brain, because we, we haven't always recognized we're not giving ourselves the best possible cognitive diet sometimes, uh, because of the world we're now in. We were talking about animals, we are animals. My dad adopted a cat, he took a cat from a shelter. And he lives in a quite a spacious area where a big garden and the vet said to him, Okay, when you get home, you need to bring the cat to the front door and scare the bejesus out of the cat. Right? <laughs> so my dad got like a big pot uh, and like brought the cat to the big door and goes, This is your home and smashes the, <laughs> the pot. The cat's like, Ah, you know, the way the cat like in a cartoon jumps up, runs it back into the house. And my dad goes, what do you make of that, Aiden? And I was like, oh, well, what what I think was happening there, 
And this is our next topic is by creating emotional memory for the cat, the cat is going to remember that very, very clearly where its home is, <laughs> if it ever recovers, that is. But this brings us to chapter two of your book, which is about emotional memory, uh, the circuitry of fear, etc, how that all works, etc. I'd love you to give us an overview of this. Gosh, well, memory is uh, memory is one of the most fascinating aspects of the human brain, because we imagine, you know, imagine if we didn't have memory, and there have been lots of different um, examples of people who've lost their memories through either brain, a brain disease or through an accident. Um, and, you know, they have nothing to go on. So our memories make us who we are. And without memory, we we have nothing to rely on to help us interpret the world around us. Because we're all designed to look forward, but we're also designed to use what we know of the past to help us interpret new information. So we need those memories. But memory is notoriously unreliable. And uh, we only have to listen to eyewitness testimony to know that. And every time we revisit a memory, um, we add to it. So we shape it again in some uh, in some way. So memory is both reconstructive and constructive. Um, and so we, we build our memories. Now, the area of the brain that gets a lot of traction and uh, coverage is the hippocampus. And this is the area of the brain that's affected by Alzheimer's, dementia. It's a seahorse type structure, which actually takes its name from the Greek word for seahorse, and the amygdala sits at the end of it. So the hippocampal region is of absolute fascination to me because it's so affected by stress. And people who are stressed for a long time, one of the early signs, warning signs of stress is memory deficits, loss of memory. Um, and so we have to pay attention to these um, these small cognitive failures because it could be a warning sign for something greater. Now, people who are at stress for long periods of time do put them at themselves at more risk of cognitive degenerative decline, which is the scary thing. The hippocampus is remarkable because, uh, and this stores our episodic memory. This is memory that's personal to us. Procedural memory, like memory of riding a bike or a skateboard or driving a car, that sits somewhere else in the brain. Um, and so that sits in another area where we house uh, more of our habitual automatic responses. So there's a lovely example of this. So if you have, um, if your hippocampus gets affected, you don't affect your procedural memory. And the best example of this is Clive Waring, who is uh, one of the greatest examples of how memory works. He's still alive today, I think, I hope. And he suffered a terrible brain in illness uh, called herpes encephalitis, and his he lost. Uh, most of his memories. His memory exists in 10 seconds now. So his wife, Deborah, has been uh, with him all the way through, but he can't remember an awful lot of his life. He can only remember the here and now. He can remember that he, he can remember his wife and that he loves his wife, but he can't remember conversations he had 10 seconds ago. But he was the most incredible pianist and he can still sit down at a piano and play amazingly but he can't remember his personal memories. So memory is a really incredible thing. Semantic memory, which is memory of facts, like, you know, uh, Paris is the capital of France. Um, that sits, again, in another part of the brain. So, But the memory function that we tend to rely probably most heavily on is the hippocampal region. Now, the amazing thing about this region is that um, we can protect it. And one of the things, and I'm not suggesting that if we do this, we definitely won't get dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, but if we exercise, physical cardiovascular exercise actually works like fertilizer or miracle grow on the brain. And this is, I think, quite astounding. So we can actually grow new neurons in the hippocampal region through physical exercise. And the hippocampus only started to really grow when we learned to walk. So like you said earlier, the body and the brain have this symbiotic relationship. We can't just talk about mental well-being. We have to talk about well-being because the body and the brain have this reciprocal relationship. When we move, our brain is much happier. And because we've lived in a world for the last two and a half years where we've 
jammed ourselves into a chair for the whole day and stayed there, or our commute has now gone down to 16 steps, um, we aren't moving as much. And so our brain has started to suffer as a result. So memory and movement, the hippocampus started to form when we learned to walk. Memory and movement go hand in hand. And so to get the best out of our memory, we've got to keep our body active. The brain is just like a physical muscle, like, you know, uh, your arms or your legs. We could keep it exercised through testing it, uh, giving it challenges all the time. Uh, but we do need to make sure that we get the best at, the best out of it by constantly giving it this these tests and challenges. Because if we don't do that, we lose our capacity to remember. You mentioned that famous black cab test the t the knowledge test where the hippocampus actually gets bigger i'd love you to take our audience through that yes yeah, so that was ucl university college london so black cab drivers uh for those people who are listening who aren't living in london um black cab drivers are a remarkable species because they have to learn something called the knowledge and the knowledge is about 26,000 routes and little alleyways and landmarks and hotels and buildings and historical sites in London. And they have to commit this to memory. So it's almost like they're creating a neural sat nav in their brain. And the scientific researchers at UCL wanted to see with the hippocampal region. Now, you'd, you'd you know, I've said semantic memory um, is stored somewhere differently. The hippocampus has to take it in first before it then gets moved. So they're using the hippocampus to um, as the first port of call for this memory. So they they wanted to see, they scanned the black, black cab, cab driver's brains over a five-year study. And they found that over five years of learning the knowledge, and it can take black cab drivers about three to four years to learn the knowledge. And the failure rate is high. And what they found was that the hippocampus started to grow and grow and grow and grow. And the minute they stopped being black cab drivers, the hippocampus would start to shrink again. Quite a remarkable study. So it's an incredible, it shows that how plastic, you know, we talk about neuroplasticity and the brain is remarkably malleable and it can change shape throughout our lives, right up until our 90s. You know, we can keep our brain growing and healthy and uh, functioning really well if we help it along the way. And so the study was quite an amazing one. And um, and it showed that researchers said, you know, this is a real proof of neuroplasticity in the brain, that the brain can change and develop um, all the way through our lifespan. And we can just help it by really, but you know, learning comes with an element of pain. These things aren't easy. If you ask any black cab driver, and I'm always, whenever I get into a black cab, I always ask them how it was learning the knowledge. They will tell you chapter and verse how difficult it was and how, you know, they had to go up against the, the exam and they have to, they have to recreate the roots in their heads. They're not allowed any kind of digital device at all. Amazing. So I think we live in a world where now we can't even remember our friends' phone numbers. And this is called digital amnesia. It's really good to try and get our brains remembering again. Just to share a couple of little things that I do, like, and I, because I'm so aware of this all the time, is, you know, for example, when you get, when you're logging into a device now and you have two factor authentication, so you might get sent a code and the code might be six digits. You know, and you can copy that code and enter it. I won't copy it now, so I'll, I'll memorize it. L little things throughout the day. And because then it's like, oh, okay, well, now I have to force myself. At the start, I'd kind of remember three and three, you know, what's the first three, what's the second three, I have to look back. Now I don't. So I, I just think little, little things that you can do are so, so valuable. You, you know, when I was playing uh, professional rugby, we had this had this saying where you got to keep the opposition honest so you got to test them test their defenses make sure you know there might be a weak link there but if you don't test you don't know and i always think about that you got to keep yourself honest as well and keep testing yourself pushing your boundaries because we're the brain is so lazy and maybe we'll say something about that because i thought about what you said they so they create this neural pathway they create these this digital this mental sat nav cerebral sat nav and then it it actually becomes normal again and then it normalizes and i thought about change initiatives again so you're trying to transform an organization what you're actually doing is people have learned the way things are done around here and then you're introducing oh well we need a new business model 
And you can't put in a bit new business model or new way of th- doing things until you change the mental model and how people think. And that takes a lot of pain, like you say, at the start. It's, so there's always a step back before the step forward. You know what, people don't like feeling stupid at anything. So especially if we get, you know, we get older, we get more experience and expertise is a blessing and a curse, actually, for the brain. Because when we when we become expert at anything, we what we've done is we've created cognitive automatic processes which feel easy to us, which we rely heavily on. We don't think about driving when we get in the car if we're, if we're used to driving, but we will probably remember what it felt like to get into a car for the first time and it just felt horrible and it felt scary. But after a certain time when we practice, we create these well-trodden paths in the brain that the brain then loves. And the brain, it's naturally a very lazy instrument because if we think about historically, the brain had to find the easiest route through to anything. Cognitive ease is what the brain craves because historically we didn't know when we were going to be fed again. So the brain has taught itself and told the body, lie down a lot, uh, take it easy, uh, don't expend too much energy, don't think too much, don't make too many decisions. You need to conserve your energy because you need to. You don't know when you're, where your next meal is coming from. So this is the brain we still have that loves these, you know, this cognitive ease. So, you know, I always say to people, if I'm with them, fold your arms. It's a very, it's a very uh, tried and tested trick. So I get people to fold their arms and then, you know, the way they normally fold their arms. And then if they fold their arms the other way, it feels weird because it's not something they're used to. And equally, I have little tests that I give people to show them how difficult it is to move away from something that they find cognitively easy. So in change efforts, what we're asking people do is to give up the cognitive ease that they have created for themselves and to get themselves off the paths of least resistance and to rewire their brains. And if you look at a brain that's learning versus a brain that's that's habitual, The brain that's habitual uses very little energy. The brain that's learning uses a shed load of energy because it's having to consume all this energy to to learn. And this comes with an element of pain. This comes with, you know, feeling we, we have to learn to feel useless at something again before we feel better. And we have to then practice. And so we practice and practice and practice, but it doesn't, it's easier not to. And so we don't, we give up. I know at the beginning of lockdown, everyone was saying, oh, I'm going to learn five languages, four instruments. (laughs) And I'm asking people now, how many languages did you learn? How many instruments? None. (laughs) Because, you know, it was, and plus we were really scared. We didn't know what was going to happen next. So, you know, it's just easier not to learn. And people who've learned any sport in their adult life you know I learned skiing in my late 30s and I'm still not a great skier and it was horrible I hated it I hated every second I still don't love it um but I had to watch these children who looked like they were born on skis ski past me with deep frustration thinking I'll never get it I'll never get it but we have to rewire the brain and when you're asking people to change in organizations and give up what they have become good at Uh, it's a very difficult thing for them to do. And they're not being difficult. Their brains are just saying, hang on a second, I I need time to rewire. Give me some time, be patient with me. Um, This isn't going to be easy. We'll only have time for one more topic, and I had it was really painful for me to (laughs) to pick here. But I've gone to visual perception because I am so fascinated by this. Like, visual perception used two thirds of the electrical activity in the brain, it's a huge part of how we perceive the world, how we actually filter things out that are there. And I always wonder what the heck is there that I can't see energy, waves of energy, light that I can't see colors that I can't perceive, etc. And there's a, a little quote here that I used to tee you up and please, please bring it any which way you like you said, When we receive a visual image from our optic nerve, the brain then adds two extra elements to this image, our existing memory, and our interpretation of the image that we are currently seeing. We are constantly comparing what we see with what we already know. And we often see only what we expect to see. 
this can make us blind to other items or objects in our visual field. And I love that for many reasons. One is the actual just the fact that that happens to us on an everyday basis. The second is, I think that is exactly what happens in organizations for leaders, when you expect the world to work a certain way, and you've been successful with that way in the past, and then everything changes like a pandemic or like disruption or like inflation. And things don't work the same way anymore. But you still expect them to and you look for confirmation biases that will tell you that they are going to work that way. And as a result, leadership struggles in times like this. And I just think it's such a perfect way. But perhaps you'll take us through how this actually works. Maybe the RAS as well, the reticular activating system, yeah. which is such an important aspect. Yes, thank you. Right. Well, yes, the visual system is, is I find it absolutely fascinating because there is no mechanism in the brain for ensuring that what we see is what, what is really there. And I've said this before, and I think this is what we have to keep reminding ourselves of. So all information coming in through our eyes gets sent to, again, this sits inside our temporal lobe. There's a structure called the thalamus, and the thalamus is near the hypothalamus. And the thalamus is a sort of a holding hub of sensory information. All our sensory inputs, except our sense of smell, go into the thalamus and then get sent out to the various parts of the brain. So, so our eyes aren't there to see. Our eyes are simply there to take in visual input. And the optic nerve travels from the eyes to the back of the head. So this is the area that we see with. And um, this, this has been the uh, study of so much research, the subject of so much research from the attentional system to dreams, to, uh, you know, it's a bit of a fascinating field. When we take in information, the brain always makes a relative decision. The brain always says, what is this like? And so if you imagine, uh, the best way to describe this is if you've, you're eating frog's legs for the first time. And most people, you know, if you're not living in France, you might eat frog's legs later in your life. And it's a very big deal putting something new into the mouth because, you know, it could have been poisonous. And, you know, so the brains had to say to the, the brains learned to say to us, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. So the first thing the brain does is say, that tastes like something that feels safe and familiar. You're okay to eat it. And of course, people then compare the taste of frog's legs to chicken because chicken is a safe, familiar taste. So that's the best way to, um, to, to show that. And so the brain is constantly comparing and contrasting information it cut, that comes in. Now, there's a structure that sort of sits in the middle called the reticular activating system. And this really um, helps with our powers of awareness. So this helps the brain pick out from the information that's coming in, pick out what's important to us. And then it tells us where to focus our attention. What we have to remember is our attention is supremely limited and it works like a torch spot spotlight. So when we pay attention to something and we're using our frontal lobe for this and the frontal lobe is easily tired and easily hungry. It's a bit like a teenager it, and it uh, it behaves like a teenager. So it gets very fed up and very tired by the end of the day. Um, and so we can't, we can't turn it on all the time. But when we pay attention, we are shining a torch spotlight onto what we think is relevant to us. And the brain is telling us what's relevant. So for example, if you buy a car, uh, and you want a car, um, and you uh, you know what car you want, you're looking forward to your car, you've just bought your car, you see your car everywhere, because the brain is picking out your car in the world around you, um, because it's relevant to you. So it always shines a spotlight on something that's meaningful, significant, or relevant to you. But what the thalamus then does, is that it darkens out everything else. So we literally become blind to what we're not paying attention to. And the minute we want to switch attention, we put other things into darkness. So we can only pay attention to quite a narrow view. And when we're stressed and when we're worried, 
the way we sense our world changes, our field of vision becomes even narrower because we're having to really pay attention on this. And so we take in sensory input and interpret it very differently when we're in a state of stress and uncertainty. So because of that, we then suffer from something called inattentional blindness. We don't see what we don't pay attention to. And Trafton Drew, who is an amazing psychologist researcher in New York, did a study with radiologists and he asked them to look uh, under a microscope at lungs. And these lungs, these radiologists were looking for cancer and he put this little gorilla the size of a matchbox under the microscope, which should have been perfectly obvious if the radiologists knew they were there. But he then asked them afterwards, did you see the little gorilla. And 80% of them didn't see the gorilla because they weren't looking for it. They were looking at the lungs for cancer. So we literally darken out, we put into shade what we aren't expecting to see or what we um or what we don't, what we're not paying attention to. And we need to remember this. And so other people might be paying attention to different things. So this is again why we need people with different fields of vision, different lenses around us, so they can pick up things that we might have become blind to. And uh, they may have seen things that we literally haven't seen. And we'd say, well, I didn't see that. Well, you didn't see it, not because you're stupid, but because you were actually paying attention to something else. But this explains too why we can't multitask. We can't split our attention into two different areas because the brain simply doesn't let us. And when we try to do this, uh, we put a lot of cognitive pressure on ourselves and this can feel quite stressful there's a movie elena that i loved it, it's called wag the dog it, it was like one of the most brilliant movies that didn't really get very far robert de niro dustin hoffman it, it was fantastic and it, it was about for our audience who don't know i'm not this is not a spoiler alert or anything like that but essentially the president commits a misdemeanor the president of the united states so they create a fake war to divert attention for everybody. And I thought about how, well, politicians have known that for years, that you create a sense of fear, a point of fixa fixation. And then you can slip in all kinds of policies that otherwise would have been objected to while everybody's paying attention there. Equally, just as a magician will try and distract your attention, knowing that you can't attend to multiple things at the same time. And... I say all that to say, well, this is something we need to be aware of personally, but also where we can use it to our advantage. So I, I often think of, for example, vision in an organization. So as I mentioned, one of the roles I have is consulting with organizations. And oftentimes I talk about vision. And I, I, I tell them about the RAS, the reticular activating system and go, if you articulate, again, ad nauseum, storytelling is so important why we're doing what we're doing and what we're doing people will then understand it it will activate the reticular activating system and then they look for evidence that we're actually making it towards that vision it is so so important and then equally and i'd love you to maybe share this as our final message gratitude journaling and practices like that at night time just before you go to bed again telling yourself what is important to you looking for evidence that these things are important to you. And you literally can rewire your brain and become more positive orientated. I mean, yeah, you know, gratitude is the biggest antidote to disappointment. You know, being grateful for what you have, not looking for what you don't have. Um, and I think that's um, critical uh, to be able to, because we can always look for things we don't have and things we're disappointed in. And it's the way we choose to see the world around us and see the lives we've had and considering ourselves lucky and being grateful for that is, I just think, one of the best things we can do. And you talked about the, you know, the why, why, why do we do this? And why do we do what we do? Now, this is a, an incredible phenomenon in the human brain, but the brain loves to have the why answered. So the seemingly innocuous word because carries so much power in the human brain because the brain you know, remember i said the brain hates uncertainty and the brain needs certainty and the word because creates certainty in the brain it helps us understand 
at why we're doing this. And, and we may not love the reason, but any reason will do. And the study that really showed this, and I don't think I talk about this in the book, but I certainly talk about this in my talks, is it was way back and it, it was a fantastic study in Harvard. And they had a team of researchers trying to jump to the front of the queue at a photocopier machine. So the good old days of Xerox machines. And they tried three times. The first time they just said, can I get to the front of the queue or the line? And uh, and you know, I think 60% of people just said, okay, but very grudgingly. And the next two times they gave reasons, but the reasons were ridiculous. They were rubbish reasons. So the first reason was, can I jump to the front of the line uh, because I have some pages to photocopy? And you think, well, hang on a second, we've all got pages to photocopy. But Pete, 93% allow people because they just had a reason. We may not, you know, be rocking from the rafters with the reason, but at least we have the reason and we love just need to know why. And this, the third time, it was an even worse reason. Can I jump to the front of the of the queue or the line? Because I'm in a rush. Well, hold on a second. We're all in a rush. And again, 93 to 94%. So unbelievable. So, so the brain loves to know why. And giving people a reason a reason to be there, a reason to connect. And this is why now the work, you know, getting people, giving people this reason to come back to the office, to come back to be with each other. Because remember, people are very frightened still. Fear is not something that leaves us easily. It's one of our strongest emotions. Um, and it's it's been with us for a long time as a close companion. And people are scared. So giving people a very compelling reason to come back, to be with each other again, is going to be critical for organizations um, as they reconnect and get and and rebuild their cultures. So that work you're doing, Aidan, is going to be incredibly valuable for, for organizations. <laughs> I was just thinking about like a CEO was listening to us and they're like, okay, so I just have to say because and they're like, oh, the, <laughs> and somebody's because, like on because. a town hall, <laughs> they're like, why are we doing this? And they're like, because my drop. <laughs> <laughs> exactly and that's how we say to kids just because <laughs> yeah exactly, exactly. And they, they don't argue with that sometimes no, no. Because, but you know we do have to find we have to give a reason it doesn't <laughs> what, I, what i what i always say to people don't try and perfect your reasons give a reason because people will think oh well, at least i know you know yeah that, that's the reaction and anything that comes after the word because tends to scoot below the level of consciousness anyway so it gets to us and we think, oh, OK, and we move. Out. You know, we've, been, we, we've all been at the scanner at the airport and somebody comes rushing in with their tray and says, I've got to get past. I've got a plane to catch. And you see everybody going, OK. And then you think, hang on a second. I've also got a plane to yeah, catch. Yeah. But they, you know, we do it because we've had the reason and we just need to know why. The word you know, answering the why is really important. Now, very quickly, though, asking people why is not a great question word. So when you're trying to get people to give you information, the why question word gets you a very glib response. So don't ask people why, always answer the why for them. But when you're trying to get information from them, how and what words are far more powerful than why and who. Why just gets you a very superficial response. Who can sometimes sound a bit like a witch hunt or an accusation, but how and what words actually draw out more information. So giving the why, not asking the why, and asking how and what, um, that's how I would use language and questioning. Speaking of which, how can people find you for keynotes, for consulting, etc? Where can they find you? LinkedIn is probably the best place. I'm not very good on LinkedIn or social media because of what I know it does to the brain sometimes, but thank goodness it's there because it's helped us all connect. Um, and um, and you know, and if you Google me, you'll find you'll probably find me somewhere on the internet. Um, I do have a little business called Checkered Leopard uh, with a very. Uh, I wrote it all in rhyme because it was I was raised on Dr. Seuss and I just love rhyme. So I just did it really in a fun way. But um, yes, you, you will find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best place to find me. And I really look forward to part two. We'll get into so much more. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Just a reminder to our audience, I have a copy of Helena's brilliant book up for grabs, Why We Do What We Do, Understanding Our Brain to Get the Best Out of Ourselves and Others. 
Dr. Helena Bosky. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Aidan. It's been an absolute pleasure. Nice one, Helena. As always, thank you to our sponsor, Zai, boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services, enabling businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. Check out Zai at hellozai.com. I'll see you soon for part two of why we do what we do with Helena Bosky.